Please, please hold. Sorry about that. Um, the security system decided to kick in right at that moment and close down everything. So we're back. All right, let's start over again. Good morning. Today is Tuesday, October the 13th. Uh, welcome to the Board of Multnomah County Commissioner's Informational Board Briefing. In accordance with the Declaration of Emergency announced on March 11th and extended by the Board of County Commissioners on September 24th, Today's meeting is being held virtually. I want to thank everyone for bearing with us through uh, technical difficulties that will and already have come up, uh, and we expect probably to have more of them today. Please remember to mute your mic when you're not speaking, and before you present, please make sure that your mic is unmuted and your camera is on. I ask presenters to remember that the public may be listening via telephone, so please state your name before responding to questions. Today's informational briefing is on the Oregon Historical Society and the Levy Oversight, uh, blah, 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 Levy Oversight Committee. Um, I'm really um, honored this morning to welcome a few guests from both the Oregon Historical Society and the Levy Oversight Committee. The Oversight Committee, um, as you may or may not know, is tasked with ensuring that the funds that our historical societies receive are spent appropriately and in alignment with the directives of the ballot measure. In accordance with the measure, OHS and the Oversight Committee are virtually coming before the board today for our annual briefing. I want to acknowledge the difficult times the Historical Society and the Levy Oversight Committee have already faced this year. I was extremely sad to learn the, uh, hear of the passing of one of our LOC members, Katie Namba. Katie was a caring community leader, and my heart goes out to her mother and to her family. And as I'm sure we all know by now, on Sunday night, OHS sustained significant damage. Carrie, I am sure you will give us an update about that during your segment on today, during today's briefing. First, I just want to say that I'm relieved that the damage was limited, limited to what it was and that no one was hurt. But what happened made me really angry. Historical societies play an outsized role in how a community interprets, learns, processes, and interacts with its history. But when histories are told solely through the lens of the dominant culture, when atrocities are whitewashed and lionized, when diverse voices from the past are silenced and erased, we've seen the bigotry, harm, and narrowness of perspective that can result. And that's why the Oregon Historical Society is such an asset to our community. OHS has shown us what it looks like to wrestle with a fuller, deeper, and more honest account of the history of the land that we call our home today. And that's especially critical in a state like Oregon, where our history of violence, displacement, and discrimination against indigenous, black, and other communities of color aren't just remnants of the past, but modern legacies that shape our current day. Over the last several years, I've seen the Historical Society make it a priority to lift up communities of color through their culturally specific exhibits and events. And I know that people who identify as Pacific Northwest Native Americans use the Society's archives to learn more about their families' histories. I've seen OHS increasingly take great care to give historically marginalized communities the platform to tell their own stories to each other and to the wider community. And I've read your literature that genuinely wrestles with how ugly our past, how our ugly past informs our current day. I've watched the exhibits that give incredible depth to stories about communities 
that have, despite everything, made Oregon their home through sheer resistance and will. Stories that might not have any other venue to be told in Oregon, but are no less central to the Oregon story. Like other institutions, OHS has worked hard to respond to the community's calls for what stories need to be told and heard. More and more OHS tells the stories that show the human costs of the systemic inequities and broken promises that have fueled the protests our community has seen since late May. Their presence in our community furthers our efforts to hold our history and ourselves accountable and to drive change for a better and more just future. The acts of destruction perpetuated on OHS were misguided and regressive and showed little understanding of the invaluable perspectives and stories that they allow marginalized communities to tell and others to hear. I'm sorry to hear that this took place, but I am grateful that so many of the society supporters have already stepped up. I look forward to seeing the work of OHS continue and grow and help us all learn from our past to create a more equitable future, even while facing setbacks like the damage that happened on Sunday. And now I want to invite our LOC co-chairs, June Schumann and Commissioner Diane McKeel to begin our briefing. Thank you very much for being here virtually with us this morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Kahori. Um, for the record, my name is June Arima Schumann. It is my honor to serve as co-chair of the Levy Oversight Committee for Oregon Historical Society. I'm joined uh, today uh, in this virtual presentation by co-chair Diane McKeel and by Terry Kump uh, Timchuk, Executive Director of the Oregon His Society. To follow your comments, Chair Kafori, uh, I'm going to ask Carrie Timchuk to give us all a briefing on the events from Sunday night because it is in the front of all of our attention at this point. So Carrie, and then we will, Diane and I will follow uh, Carrie and, and, and then Carrie will close the meeting with the intended reports that we have prepared for today. So Carrie. Thank you, Chair Truman, and thank you, uh, Chair Kafori, for those really uh, encouraging remarks. Uh, just a yeah, quick update on the damage done. Uh, most every, the, the ground, the middle level of all of our windows in the pavilion uh, were shattered. Uh, those are huge windows, as you might recall, that look out onto the pavilion and onto the first congregational church. Uh, they were all, all broken. Uh, Three flares were thrown into the building, uh, which could have caused great damage. Uh, thankfully, they did not. Uh, there were carpet, uh, some of the carpet was burned and singed, but beyond that, we were very fortunate that a greater fire did not start. Uh, you know, the, the sad, uh, only one artifact was was touched. It was one we had in on display in the pavilion. It was the beautiful African-American heritage bicentennial quilt that was uh, made uh, back in from 1974 to 1976 by 15 uh, African-American women here in Portland and traveled the country to the Smithsonian and back during that year. Uh, we had it on display for Portland Textile Month. It was taken that evening. Uh, thankfully, uh, police found it several blocks away and returned it. And we have been, uh, our curators have been working on it ever since. It was very, very wet. Of course, kind of some of the colors were running, but they believe it, it can be saved. And it's just really a wonderful um, asset and artifact for our, for our collection. And we hope to have it, hope, hope it will be back almost as good as new. Um, if there's lemonade out of the lemon, I'm always trying to do that. Uh, it is the response, as you said, Chuck, for that we have received. I cannot even begin to tell you uh, how many emails and phone calls and, uh, you know, instant messages and you name it that, uh, that came yesterday from supporters around Portland, around the county and, and across the state. Uh, echoing your message, Chair Kafori, knowing that uh, of our work here, uh, of course, the most, uh, as I took with me yesterday, I'm holding up again, the, the dollar bill and the wonderful note written on a napkin from Oscar 
the homeless person who said he saw your windows and I wanted to help. You once gave me a free tour before the pandemic, so this is a thank you. Uh, received a lot of uh, donations, as I've said in my time here. None mean more than this one dollar from from Oscar. Um, also was very heartened by the number of tribal leaders that reached out to us yesterday uh, to say that they stood with us, including the Portland Indian Leaders Roundtable, uh, which issued a statement uh, saying that the destruction of the Oregon Historical, at the Oregon Historical Society was so very disappointing, especially given the great care they have given to their exhibits that display Native American history so honestly and respectfully. We thank them for their deep consultation with tribal nations to create these exhibits and wish them the best in the repairs to their building. Uh, so we really appreciated that message. And an example of some of the messages we received, uh, one was from your friend, uh, I know you all know, and uh, Mike Alexander, uh, former head of the Portland Urban League. And Mike said, there are a few institutions in this nation, let alone this state, that have taken a more forthright and principled stand in telling the harsh and unvarnished history of the treatment of marginalized people in this state. Please accept my thanks for all that you and OHS represent and know that many of us see you as one of our most cherished allies. So uh, appreciate those messages and we hope to uh, be always seen as a cherished ally. Uh, our plan is to, we're doing some more cleanup today. I just can't begin to tell you the amount of broken glass uh, that was in the building. Uh, and we are hoping and uh, planning on uh, reopening tomorrow. Uh, to the public. And uh, as I say, you know, uh, one of our exhibits, as you know, is the exhibit celebrating the suffrage, the centennial of women's suffrage called Nevertheless, They Persisted. So we're going to persist and uh, we look forward to opening tomorrow. And I'll uh, highlight other uh, actions of the last year in my report following the, the commissioners, the chairs. Back to you, June. Thank, Thank you. Carrie. Carrie. Um, back again to June Schumann. Um, it was uh, a little a year ago uh, on October 3rd, uh, 2019, that we were before you uh, in person to, it, it was face to face at that time to deliver our annual report. Le needless to say, the months since then, specifically the months between March and now, have been really challenging. Um, I'm pleased to report that the Levy Oversight Committee has not dropped uh, uh, a, a second in our task and the Historical Society has uh, helped us uh, connect with each other via uh, Zoom meetings and we have had two meetings so far on April 2nd and on June 26th, where committee members had an opportunity to hear updates from the Oregon Historical Society and the four East County organizations, and to ask questions and other suggestions to the organization. And let me assure the commissioners that this Levy Oversight Committee is not shy in asking questions and offering suggestions. We have had very lively conversations over each meeting. We provided input for the OHS strategies, uh, strategic plan, uh, commented on, on OHS programs, and shared information on events and issues from our pro uh, professional and community connections. And um, I just wanted to mention that we are now in, I think, the fourth year of the second five-year levy. Um, and I, in, in reflecting on the events on Sunday, um, I just wanted to mention that this levy, uh, along with the financial support for the Historical Society, the, the act of taxing each of us to support, to put our little dollars into the support for Oregon Historical Society as a community makes this all very personal. Uh, we, it may not be uh, significant as some of the historically uh, large uh, part contributors, but each of us is now a piece of the Oregon Historical Society's work. Uh, and in many ways, we hope that the Oversight Committee has reflected that in our deliberations. I do want to thank my fellow committee members and to include their names in the record. And they are Carl Abbott, 
Mark Brown, Jennifer Burns, Jan Dill, uh, James Harrison, Philip Hillard, Siobhan James, Brian Johnson, Shannon Leonetti, Scott Nakagawa, and Chris, Kristen Teigen. And as uh, it's already been mentioned, we are missing Katie Namba, uh, who uh, was with our committee for the first three years. Uh, at this time, I want to um, turn my uh, turn the meeting over to Makio, who will continue with our report. Diane. Thank you, June. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. I am Diane McKeel, and I want to thank you, Chair, for your kind remarks at the beginning of this presentation. I join with my co-chair and all Levy Oversight Committee members in thanking the Commissioners for asking us to serve in this important role. The Multnomah County Levy that was passed by Multnomah County voters in November 2010 and overwhelmingly renewed in May 2016 set certain requirements for the Oregon Historical Society. One of the duties of the Levy Oversight Committee is to ensure that the Oregon Historical Society meets these requirements. As you will see in the written report to you, the commissioners, the Oregon Historical Society has indeed met those requirements with one very understandable exception. The language of the levy requires that the Oregon Historical Museum and Library be open a certain number of hours a week. The governor's order addressing COVID-19 required that the Oregon Historical Society and other cultural institutions and tourist attractions close to the public on March 13th, 2020. It remained closed until it was allowed to open on July 11th. You can also read in the report, and we'll hear from uh, in a moment from Oregon Historical Society Executive Director Carrie Timchuk, how the Oregon Historical Society continued to make history available and accessible to Multnomah County residents during the closure. The requirement that drew the most focus from the Levy Oversight Committee is the requirement that levy funds are allocated in a manner that represents Multnomah County's diverse cultures. As you will see in the written report, through its programs, exhibits, and publications, the Oregon Historical Society has done an impressive job in fulfilling that requirement. You've also been provided reports from the Gresham Historical Society, the Troutdale Historical Society, the Crown Point Historical Society, and the East County Historical Organization detailing how they use the levy funds that are allocated to them. These important uh, funds allow them to fulfill their missions to educate and to share the rich history of East Multnomah County. And I do believe we have representatives from East, each of those historical societies here with us at the presentation. Before calling on Carrie Timchuk to complete our presentation, let me extend thanks from the committee to Anna Allen for the outstanding job she has done in serving as the liaison from the county chair's office to the levy oversight committee. As you all well know, Anna was recently on maternity leave, and we also want to thank Raphael Tamarchi for stepping into that role. I will now turn it over to Carrie Timchuk. Thank you. Am I on? Yep, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Uh, Chuck Kafori, members of the commission, for the record, I am Carrie Timchuk, Executive Director of the Organist Society. My privilege to virtually appear before you today with LOC co-chairs Schumann and McKeel as we make our annual report. As the co-chairs have reported, the relationship between the LOC and OHS remains strong and transparent. And I join with them in thanking Anna and Raphael for the work they have dedicated to keeping everyone on task. The mission of OHS is to preserve our state's history and to make it accessible to everyone in ways that advance knowledge and inspire curiosity about all the people, places, and events that have shaped Oregon. There is no doubt that this levy, which was first adopted, as Chair McKeel said, by the voters of Multnomah County in 2010, 
and overwhelmingly renewed in 2016, has been instrumental in ensuring that we fulfill that mission and that the four East County historical organizations also supported by the levy fulfill theirs. The financial stability provided by the levy funding has allowed us to meet and exceed the promises made to the voters in the levy language. I am re reminded this year of the words of the legendary radio broadcaster, Paul Harvey, who once said, in times like these, it's always good to remember there have always been times like these. With all due respect to the memory of Mr. Harvey, I don't think there have ever been times quite like these. I am immensely proud and hope that the people of Multnomah County are proud of how OHS has adjusted and innovated in these challenging times and how we have served as a very important resource for the people of Multnomah County. Details of our work are in the written reports submitted to the commissioners, along with reports, as was said, from the East County organizations. With the remainder of my time, I will offer you a PowerPoint here that encompasses some highlights of how we have met our mission since the world turned upside down on March 13th. Uh, we'll begin, and I, I'll just say next slide, and I know I'll get some help there from the, from the commission. So next slide, a community engagement will begin there. Uh, next slide. Um, the first thing we did uh, the week after the pandemic shut everyone down was to reach out to all uh, Oregonians and all Multnomah County re residents uh, to ask them to share their stories, uh, to understand that we are li living through a historic time. And just as we have in our collection, the diaries and journals of individuals who came across the Oregon Trail, we wanted diaries and journals of individuals living through this new time, this new uncharted territory. Uh, people reached out to us in by the hundreds, by the thousands, many if not most coming from Multnomah County. They were heartbreaking, heartwarming. The first couple of weeks, many were talking about the uh, the endless search for toilet paper, <laughs> but then uh, talking about kids, their, what their kids were doing, and the, the, no school, and healthcare professionals, and aging parents. Uh, these are priceless additions to our collection, and we hope we never have to go through another one of these pandemics, and, and these will be just such a valuable part of our collection. I think you can see the next two slides also mention the share the story campaign as as we called it. Uh, so if you wanted to zip through the next two slides here, so and there. Uh, so with the digital engagement, obviously, since people couldn't come to the museum uh, to the library, we had to take it to them. And so we have done that through our digital assets, through uh, our emails, through the Oregon Encyclopedia, through the Oregon History Project, through weekly uh, e-digest that goes to 16,000 readers, more signing up every day, where we shared the history, uh, focusing on the history of the time. Uh, many of the entries were on issues such as dealing with a pandemic and the one that happened uh, during World War I, the Spanish flu and, uh, pandemic, or dealing with issues of social justice and racial equity when those issues came, came to the forefront. Uh, we were sending these twice weekly to 16,000. Now we're back to once weekly, now that we're opening the museum. Uh, I said more and more people come every day, are, are signing up every day. Uh, so maybe Chair Kafori, in one of your, your uh, e-blasts you send out to all yours, you can say, here's how to sign up for free. Uh, to get these get these e blasts, um, chalking the vote is the next the next slide. Uh, you want to go to the next one uh, to help community members better understand the important history of the long and continuing struggle and suppression of universal suffrage. We combined with the Oregon Women's History Consortium to launch a chalk the vote project, uh, which is which is in conjunction with our exhibit on the centennial of women's suffrage. And here you can see some uh, people who are chalking the vote. And the next slide is, uh, as well, it talks about the, uh, the campaign aims to honor, comp complicate, and be in conversation with the many changes to voting rights in our in states and nation's history. It also provides an opportunity to reflect on how that history helps us better understand our current climate around protests, activism, civil rights, and voting. There's honoring Mary Beatty, uh, one of the early suffragist uh, uh, pioneers back in the 19th century. And the next slide shows how kids have get, are getting involved, I believe. There it is. That uh, uh, wonderful uh, young uh, Oregonian is the daughter of Mary Faulkner, the chair of our board, and involved, Charlotte is her name, and involved with the uh, Chalk the Vote campaign. Uh, the exhibit, uh, which I think, 
that comes up in a bit. So uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about the exhibit in a minute. But also, if you go to the next slide, it talks about our Hatfield series. Uh, of course, like everything, we had to go virtual this year uh, with our with our speakers. Uh, and the first one was held on September 8th. It was Erica Lee, uh, her wonderful book, America for Americans, A History of Xenophobia in the United States. It was a fascinating lecture, almost a thousand people attending via, via Zoom. Uh, and coming up in October 27th, this was a real get for us. He takes very few uh, lectures around the country. Uh, and we have Henry Louis Gates, uh, probably the leading uh, black historian right now in, in, in the United States and his seminal work, Stony the Road, Reconstruction, White Supremacy, and the Rise of Jim Crow, would encourage uh, all of you to participate in that on October 27th. And, and two coming up next year, uh, you can see them also staying in the news, Evan Thomas and his, his wonderful biography of Sandra Day O'Connor, again, very newsy, of Supreme Court, and Joanne Freeman, The Field of Blood, Violence in Congress, and the Road to Civil War. Um, so we're learning to adjust with Zoom. We hope that obviously, Next year, we can go back to in-person programs. I know we're all hoping for that. Uh, the OHQ, also part of our, our education, is on the next slide. And there we go, education. Since teachers couldn't come to us, uh, we again have to go to them. We had a record number of field trips in 2019 to see the new Experience Oregon exhibit and uh, had hoped to do that throughout this year, but obviously can't. So we're going to the classrooms with free workshops to teachers in Multnomah County and, and across Oregon uh, to learn more about Experience Oregon curriculum, uh, 90 minute sessions there. Uh, again, free workshops to teachers. And I think the next slide also shows that we're also doing free workshops about Oregon History Day, uh, this great program that ties in with National History Day. And for the second year in a row this year, uh, two young Oregonians won the national competition in the documentary, one goes to student school in uh, the Beaverton, one goes to school in Portland at, the, at Lincoln, Lincoln High School. Uh, two years ago, they won the docu documentary category with their documentary on Salido Falls. And this year, they did a repeat, won the national competition with their documentary on Monero Yasui. Uh, it's, it's available for, to watch for free on our website, and it's these kids are going to be Steven Spielberg one day. It's 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 amazing what they do. Uh, so continue to, to reach out to teachers. Uh, we have curriculum that is authorized by the by the state, approved by the state in teaching history. So one of the few uh, organizations that have that. Um, then the next one uh, is the OHQ coming up. As many of you know, the the December issue uh, was devoted entirely three years in the making. Uh, to the issue of white supremacy and resistance to it in Oregon. It created uh, a lot of conversations in Multnomah County and around the state when it came out, and even more after the events of this past March and April across the country. Uh, it actually sold out. Uh, we, had to, we had to reprint it, and look like we'll have to reprint it again. It continues to be the subject of book clubs and, uh, again, rotary clubs and conversations around the state. Uh, it was we, the, the overwhelming response to it, it, it was so big that uh, you can see the next slide. Uh, Eliza Canty Jones, the editor of the OHQ, and I have developed a Zoom presentation uh, out of demand uh, that we have presented a dozen times already. We have more on the on the books. People keep asking for it. It's about a 45 minute presentation that talks about the history of racism towards indigenous people, towards blacks, towards Asians, toward Chinese, the Japanese, Latino. Uh, the largest audience so far was 700 state employees for a conference led by the Bureau of Consumer uh, Business and Consumer Services. We are now going to be keynoting the statewide employees conference on diversity, equity, and inclusion later this month with this presentation. And this slide is, is in the presentation and we say it's it's kind of the most important message coming out of it. A photograph taken at a protest here in Portland. Oregon has a racist history. There's no doubt about it, but let's not have a racist future. That's the message which we're trying to send through this PowerPoint. We offer it for free. We'd be happy commissioners to do it for Multnomah County employees for just ask and we're happy to put this uh, do this presentation uh, for all for all audiences. It's such an important uh, presentation. 
now that we're back open, uh, we're glad that people have started to return to the exhibits. Uh, and the first one up you'll see here is, uh, next one. Nevertheless, they persisted. Uh, again, the exhibit on the celebrating the centennial of women's suffrage. Uh, originally, this exhibit was supposed to run from March 13th, ironically, the day we had the close, until this fall. We are extending it well into next year uh, to give people a chance to see this amazing exhibit. We were thrilled that on the first day we opened up, look who came in the next slide. Senator Wyden was there to, uh, and brought four TV cameras with him, which we appreciate on the opening day and uh, holding up a, a tea towel he bought that we had specially uh, made. Uh, and they are reproductions of the signs that women would put up in their in their windows when they registered to vote 100 years ago. Uh, and even more important than Senator Wyden, I don't think you'd mind me saying, was our other visitor that came with him. There she is. <laughs> Commissioner Mirren joined us for uh, for to, to tour. There you go, Commissioner. And there she is reading about her hero, Esther Pohl Lovejoy, who uh, was a big suffragist back in the time and was, of course, the first woman ever to serve as a the public health officer of a major American city, uh, serving in Portland. So shout out to uh, to Esther Pohl Lovejoy and to and to Commissioner Mirren. Uh, also. Uh, uh, up now, and we'll continue again through much of next year, is We Are the Road City, uh, which explores the history of professional soccer in Portland and the cultural context of the game. Uh, this is, as you might imagine, has been a very, very fun exhibit for kids to come in and telling the story of the Timbers, the Thorns, college soccer, and, and the multicultural uh, activities that, that surround soccer. Um, next uh, slide. This was the after. This was, you know, in my in my uh, in my presentation before the events of uh, yesterday or two nights ago, we had the uh, African American bicentennial quilt in collaboration with Portland Textile Month. Uh, we have a program previously scheduled this Thursday at noon. With the, there is one uh, one of the quilters remains alive, and this is 44 years after they made the quilt, obviously. And this the young the daughter of one of the founders of the project is still with us. And she's going to be uh, uh, on a Zoom program discussing the quilt and its importance. Uh, just ending yesterday, it had been up for the next slide, I've been up for many months, was Dreams Deferred. This was the original exhibition designed by the immigrant story, and it was all about the dreamers here uh, telling their story using their testimony, photography, their voices uh, to tell the story of these immigrants uh, who came to the United States as children or young adults. Uh, it re also received a lot of attention, a lot of visitors, um, just a really moving exhibit, and it was uh, ended its run yesterday. Uh, next slide. The NATO Family Gallery. Uh, this is the, the newly named gallery, thanks to a wonderful gift from Ann NATO Campbell and the NATO family. Uh, it's a gallery we had downstairs that previously had been holding uh, an exhibit called uh, Oregon Voices, which was modern Oregon history. Uh, it was done before our new permanent exhibit, Experience Oregon, which is it, it, in Experience Oregon kind of rendered this one out of date and moot. So we are now in the process of uh, putting a new permanent exhibit there. And because uh, we do act as the Multnomah County Historical Society, and because of a, a number of requests, we are turning this gallery into a permanent gallery, a permanent exhibit on the history of Portland and Multnomah County. Uh, and, and NATO also gave us a, a wonderful gift to get this exhibit started. We're starting this year, reaching out to community members to get them involved in planning this exhibit. Uh, we're really excited about able to have a permanent exhibit just dedicated totally to the history of Multnomah County in Portland and the Oregon Historical Society. Look for a, an opening of the exhibit probably, I would say, in 2022. And then uh, the research library has been has been very busy, even the time when we weren't open. Uh, staff was able to devote a, a number of many, many hours to the digitization of oral histories. Uh, they just completed a, a project that was supported by uh, other grant making organizations to uh, for oral histories to digitize them on our website so people can access them of significant legal and political figures in Oregon and many, if not most, in Multnomah County, as you can see in the next slide. Um, 
There's uh, Judge Mercedes Diaz. Her oral history is now included in this project. There were 214 new oral histories added to our, uh, to our digit digitization are now available uh, for all Oregonians to access through our website. So a phenomenal amount of work went into these oral histories. And you can see the next one, another familiar face. One of the oral histories we added was Gladys McCoy, uh, former, of course, chair of the Multnomah County Commission was one of the new oral histories added and added also Gladys's biography, Chair McCoy's biography to the Oregon Encyclopedia. So lots of work going on uh, with our library. And uh, I think the final slide Coming up, oh, one more slide there. Oh, Al also added, uh, if you go back one, if you could. Up oh, there you go. We're working with the immigrant story uh, to announce a, a series of oral history interviews with local immigrants that are now publicly available through the OHS Digital Collection website. Again, this followed on the exhibit we did with the Dreamers, uh, now uh, sharing the oral history of immigrants and immigration uh, here in Portland. And then the final slide is just a inspiring quote that continues to guide our work here. This is from the Smithsonian Secretary Lonnie Bunch. It is important for the public to view the Smithsonian not simply as an attic of nostalgia, but as a cauldron of ideas, innovation and understanding that can be transformative for America. Uh, we found our mission in that and we've changed the words. It is important for the public to view the Oregon Historical Society, not simply as an attic of nostalgia, but as a cauldron of ideas, innovation and understanding that could be transformative for Portland, for Multnomah County, and for Oregon. Uh, so I, I know I also speak for the four East County organizations. I know many of them are listening through the, uh, the portal here. How critical uh, your support has been to them. Uh, we look forward to working with the chair and commissioners uh, to answer all questions and would hope that the, the commissioners might give the voters another chance in May of 2021 to uh, decide if they want to uh, go uh, another five-year term with this levy that has been so instrumental uh, in allowing us to do our mission. So with that, I know that uh, co-chair Schumann and McKeel, or I would be happy to respond to any questions. That was a lot. You guys are busy. <laughs> Um, and I'm frantically writing down all these events that I want to participate in, and, and we hope to have you back um, to give us the presentation that you are referring to in your um, in your remarks. So we will go through uh, commissioners by district and see if folks have comments or questions. We're going to start with Commissioner Myron. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you so much, uh, June and Diane, um, the East County organizations, and and of course Carrie. Uh, my my eyes were just like welling up so many times uh, during that presentation, uh, and uh, it just it was really really powerful and describes so well all that you do. Um, I mean not but it doesn't encompass all that you do because there's just so much. Uh, as the chair um, really said so well, uh, it has always been a priority for um, the Oregon Historical Society to lift up communities of color um, and have such a diverse array of culturally specific events and exhibits and a real commitment to telling, uh, I love that description from Michael Alexander, the, the harsh and unvarnished history um, of Oregon. Uh, I um, really appreciated uh, sort of how prescient you were uh, in terms of the reckoning that we are facing and the racial justice movement uh, sparked by the murder of George Floyd. Uh, just even in um, your 2019 issue of uh, your journal, um, which was dedicated to white supremacy and resistance. That is uh, such an incredible piece, and uh, I would encourage anyone to get a hold of a copy. Sounds like they're back in stock and uh, and read that. Um, I, as so many were, um, horrified and shocked uh, to learn of the destruction of the Oregon Historical Society yesterday. And um, although I'm thankful that there was no injury, uh, profoundly thankful, uh, 
I have to admit, uh, I was um, extremely uh, horrified and moved at a very deep level um, because it just somehow the dis the di so many of the events that we're facing today uh, make me think back to you know the 1930s in Germany and the Holocaust and what led up to that. But something about um, what happened, the violation at the Oregon Historical Society really hit home uh, and invoked images uh, to me of Kristallnacht, um, November 9th, the night in 1938, when um, the uh, Nazi paramilitary force went and broke it. Kristallnacht means it's the night of broken glass. When they went out and destroyed uh, the businesses, um, the businesses, synagogues, other structures of um, Jews, and people just stood by and let this destruction happen. Um, this description of broken glass and flares being thrown. Uh, but what inspires me, and from your description, um, what moved me so much was uh, that the response of our community was not to stand by. The response of our community was to stand up. And I am so uh, just encouraged by the outpouring of support that you received, uh, Carrie, at when all of this happened. And um, one of those moments that brought tears to my eyes when I read it in your um, in the statement that you put out, but again here today was when I um, saw that letter and you told us about the donation of Oscar, that one dollar that um, he used to sort of pay pay forward the kindness that you showed him, uh, and uh, that just speaks volumes and is so meaningful. Um, in terms of the levy itself, I mean, obviously, you have so far met and exceeded uh, the um, promises that were made to our community. And um, I just, I loved hearing about all of your programs. I did not expect to see my photo up there in, the, <laughs> in those. But yes, Esther Lovejoy is one of my heroes. And I never would have actually known that much about her except for except for the Oregon Historical Society and Carrie um, giving me uh, just such an incredible uh, lesson in history. And so thank you just for, for everything. Um, the quote that you said at the end uh, really says it says so much and it does directly apply, apply to the Oregon Historical Society and your institution. Um, our hearts are with you as you are um, healing from the damage that occurred yesterday. And uh, we're just, I speak for myself, but I imagine the feeling is shared. I'm so inspired by the work you continue to do and uh, and the service that you provide to our community, um, even in these most challenging of times. Thank you. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair, um, and and the feeling is shared. Thank you, Commissioner Myron. This was really so inspiring. Thank you, all of you, for being here, Carrie, June, and Commissioner McKeel. Um, thank you for the work that you're doing. I want to echo my dismay about the events of Sunday night. Um, you and your team have worked so hard to bring Oregonians. I love the phrase you used somewhere in your presentation about bringing people into conversation with history. And you have worked so hard to bring Oregonians into conversation with our history, including its most difficult and ugly parts. And, um, you know, I think the damage to the building, um, it, 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 it doesn't feel like just property damage. This one feels like damage to that shared enterprise of bringing our our state and our, our constituents into conversation with our shared history. So um, I, 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 I'm so sorry that it happened and that you're dealing with it. And I am looking forward to coming and visiting when you are back open. Uh, so much to appreciate in the information that you've shared and the programs that you've described. I can't mention them all, but um, 
you know, that the uh, quarterly history on white supremacy last year was was fascinating and so, so important. Um, and I particularly, uh, there was a particular chapter that resonated with me because you had a chapter about such a little known slice of Oregon's and Portland's history, which was anti-Hindu riots in the St. John's neighborhood of Portland. Um, and in fact, we were about to, my office and I were about to participate in a commemoration of that this March. And of course we were, deterred, deferred by, by COVID. Um, but just uh, an important example of the ways in which white supremacy permeated the landscape, including in Portland, which we think of sometimes as being different in some way. Um, love the immigrant story. That's an amazing enterprise and project. And I was honored to be one of the people interviewed for that project and, um, you know, I'm a little nervous about whether I would be part of an oral history that people would be able to listen to, but I would be honored to be part of that as well. And the quilt, uh, I was so moved by seeing the quilt, uh, so moved that there's the daughter of one of the people who created that, who's gonna be participating, that just illustrates the continuity of, of history and of this work. Glad that you were able to find the quilt and that it wasn't uh, badly damaged. Um, you know, in, and it, as to the levy, yes, you've met all of the objectives. And I just, again, want to thank so much the members of the, the Oversight Committee, June, Commissioner McKeel, and the rest of your team, the service that you provide to let constituents know that their dollars are being put to good use is important, not just because of the levy, but because we continue to ask constituents to support the work that we do across multi-jurisdictions. And it's important for them to know that there is good oversight and governance. So thank you so much for all of that. And thank you again for being here today. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, thank you so much, June and Commissioner McKeel and Carrie, for being here today and for all of the work you do um, for um, on behalf of the Oregon Historical Society and for Multnomah County um, taxpayers in supporting the levy. Um, you know, I think um, uh, my colleagues have have really um, shared strongly some of the feelings that I have about what happened on Sunday night. Um, you know, when I when I think about it, I really think what happened with the with the damage to the buildings was such a physical manifestation of the lack of understanding, the lack of um, our ability right now in society to really share perspectives and understanding about where people are coming from and what you know the purpose is. And um, and I was so sad and angry um, about what happened. And I'm so glad that. Um, there has been such community support and, and um, outpouring to show how important OHS is for our community. Um, you know, for me, it was ironic because the very first place that I ever actually um, heard of and participated in a land acknowledgement was at the Oregon Historical Society. That was the first time I'd ever um, experienced that. And it was wonderful. It was at, I think it was at one of the um, celebrations of the, the statehood of Oregon. And, you know, and to me, it was ironic that, 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 that the work that you have done and really focused on over the last several years to really shine a light on Oregon's true history and the impacts it's had on all of the people who have been a part of Oregon's history and the way that impacts um, our lives today and our culture today, you know, um, was was targeted. Um, so I'm just I'm deeply sorry for that, but really um, am so committed to helping support the work of OHS and um, and your mission and continuing forward. I'm I'm thrilled to see all of the. Uh, the ways that you've been able to bring material and exhibits um, and history online so that it's more accessible to everyone right now, um, what you're doing for education, for teachers, for, for children. And I think that's just fantastic. Um, I um, I had a couple, I do have a couple of questions. Um, one, you know, I it was, it's pretty amazing that the first online um, um, uh, speech that you had, um, the, the, the speakers that you were focused focusing on were had a thousand participants and I know we're all um, excited for the for the chance where we can get be in person for those kinds of things again but I think that it's such an opportunity um, that you know one of the silver linings of this whole thing has been that we're able to actually bring things before that were limited to people to so many more people I'm um, sorry I just was curious if you had plans to continue to be offering some of those things um, some of the exhibits even you know even going forward in an online way so that more people can um, can continue to access it. Oh. No, there you go. Yes. Uh, no, I, all museums are looking at the 
this last year and realizing that they're going to have to adjust accordingly. And people are becoming used to being able to to see things virtually. And yeah, we're working on more, adding more virtual exhibits, more virtual programs, uh, everything to our, to our digital assets. It's a, it's, you know, it's a new way of life. <laughs> It is like continues to be an opportunity. Um, and then the other thing is, so it sounds like you you'll be reopening tomorrow. And so I just I, you know, I think that would be great um, for folks to have a chance to come down. So what does it look like when you if you're going to go and, and visit OHS today? Like what is what's that experience like for folks? Well, it is, of course, we're compliant by all the rules uh, by the state, by the county. It's, uh, you know, masks are required, uh, social distancing. Uh, you know, we have hand sanitizers throughout the building. Uh, we can only, uh, given our space, we can only have 100 people in the building at one time. So we, we keep track of that. Uh, it's, you know, the windows have all been boarded up, the lower levels, it's, it's going to be look different. Uh, but uh, we, we, we welcome people back and we're, we're planning next week it happens to be Abigail Scott Dunaway's birthday. So we're looking for a way to uh, you know, call attention to that and to the Nevertheless Safe Persistent exhibit and hope, you know, celebrate her birthday and, and all things uh, women's suffrage. But it's, it, it, it'll be, uh, we, there is some graffiti on the walls. We hope to, outside walls, we hope to remove some, you know, some foul language. We'd like to get that removed before people start coming back. So a little bit of painting to do, but it's it, it will be, I think, the, the normal experience uh, people have during this time, uh, but, but just with the so much wood <laughs> on the windows, so. Well, that's something I think we all were familiar with here at the county too, but I just appreciate all the work that's going into making it a place where people can come back. And um, I'm really excited to check out the the youth docu documentaries that you um, were talking about with my kids. And um, also some of the materials that were sent over included some of the pictures of the of the work that's happening with the, the East County Historical Societies, and including like the Crown Point Rock Hounds and the work that they're doing, which looked really amazing. And um, my, my son and my husband are really into the rock hounding stuff too. So I was like, oh, that's something for us to check out as well. So just appreciate the um, your time today and all the work that you're doing and just um, and, and just want to say how much um, support you have from, from me. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Carrie and Chair June and Commissioner McKill for bringing uh, all of this great information to share with us. Uh, I, I did have a, a, a question I wanted to ask you, Carrie. Uh, so how are you self-insured uh, for the vandalism or where it, where does this, you know, the budgeting come to make these repairs from? We, we do have vandalism insurance. Uh, so that okay. will, uh, obviously we had, we had a thousand dollar deductible and we had a number of people reach out to say that provide the deductible. And uh, so then, then we're insured otherwise. So no, no concerns. That's amazing. There. So. Great. Well, I am so glad to hear that, and uh, I'm so sorry to hear of, of the vandalism. Uh, the historical society is so important. In fact, I was counting all of the historical societies in my district, and I believe that there are five. There's the East County, there's Troutdale, there's the Corbett Point Country, uh, uh, and then Crown Point, and then, of course, the Gresham Historical Society. So a big shout out to all of those, because those all have their own individual boards and committee members. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to thank all of those volunteers as well. Uh, I thought, uh, you know, a lot has been talked about uh, this edition and, you know, we're all reading uh, about the racism in our country. And one of the things that I uh, walked away with it, that there's a picture of, um, of our Capitol. Uh, and I don't know if you can see that, uh, but it says this 1934 sculpture titled Covered Wagon is located just outside the Oregon State Capitol's main entrance. Uh, then goes talks about the designer. It depicts a pioneer family in front of a covered wagon and is inscribed with the following. Valiant men have thrust our frontier to the setting sun. That thrust implies claims to native land and is an exemplar of whiteness as shown in the articles of this special issue. I have to tell you, every time I go to the Capitol, I get so angry and frustrated when I see this because I know uh, I know what it stands for. And I know that um, I know that our community does not 
live by what is depicted here. Uh, so anyway, that was a huge, huge takeaway for, for me. Uh, I mean, your institution is so beloved and uh, it really, I, I appreciated your quote that it really is um, where we've been is really going to define our future and, and where we go. And uh, I think it was mentioned that we are in the fourth year of the second uh, five year of the levy and that there are going to uh, have to be some decisions made uh, come May of 2021 if this community wants to still invest in um, the Oregon Historical Society. And I would venture to say and hope that that answer is a yes, and I uh, am excited to partner uh, with you uh, and all of uh, uh, volunteers to to see that come to for fruition. So uh, I just want to thank you. I think you really have fulfilled your mission. Thank you for this report, uh, where I think it was said that your mission is to you know the oversight committee is to make sure that allocated uh, money represents diverse cultures. And you have proven that you have done that and you have done an incredible job. So thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, and thank you to all of the volunteers who continue uh, to make sure that our history is documented and shared uh, so that we can all have a better future. Thank you everyone again for coming this morning. Thank you for the presentation. And that concludes our briefing this morning. We will be back here virtually Thursday at 9.30 a.m. for our board business meeting. There being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Go check out OHS website. <laughs>